Hi everyone, thank you uh, for coming to today's Smart Grid Seminar. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Lu Yang from uh, NREO, National Renewable Energy. Uh, she is going to talk about uh, predictive analytics for power systems. Before I introduce her, uh, I want to remind everyone that yeah, our next seminar is next week at the same time. Uh, we we'll have we'll a speaker from CMU. He's going to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, Dr. Yan is a senior research engineer in the Power Systems Engineering Center at NREA. Uh, uh, areas of expertise include advanced data analytics, machine learning, and optimization in electric power systems. She currently leads uh, several projects on developing AI solutions for power system operations at NREA. She received her PhD in electrical and computer engineering from CMU and her bachelor in WE from Tsinghua University, China. And let's welcome the speaker. Yeah, thank you, Chen Wu, for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak in the uh, Smart Grid Seminar. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our work on the predictive analytics for power systems with high penetrations of the distributed energy resources. So in, in my presentation today, I will first talk about who are we and what do we do at NREL? And then I will talk about the predictive analytics and why do we think uh, they are really crucial for enabling the power system with high penetrations of renewables. Uh, I will also talk about two applications of the predictive analytics, uh, which our work have, have been focused on in the past few years. Uh, after that, I will give a quick summary and also point to you a couple of uh, resources which you can find about uh, find, find more about our work at NREL. So you probably know this already, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, which uh, NREL uh, is a national lab of the Department of Energy. Uh, we are located in Golden in Colorado, which is just a 20 minutes drive to the west uh, in, um, in Denver region. Um, so we are currently having around 3,000 people in the lab, and we have very good and work, uh, world-class uh, uh, facilities uh, to conduct uh, research in the renewable energy domain. So those world-class uh, facilities includes the energy system uh, integration facility, which you are seeing in the picture here. And uh, we also do a lot of the research in partnership with uh, utilities, uh, with industry, academia, and also governments, uh, including both uh, uh, federal and state governments. Uh, another key feature of our campus is, uh, it's actually a living laboratory uh, in our, on our campus. So we actually have a lot of uh, like uh, sensing and environments collected in our campus. Uh, we have uh, uh, rooftop PV systems, uh, EV chargers installed in our, uh, on our campus. And we also have a lot of visualization capability to showcase, you know, what is the energy consumed by different buildings uh, at our lab and uh, what are the uh, generation by the PV systems uh, uh, in our lab as well. And uh, NREL's mission really focuses on to, uh, to, uh, to enable the sustainable energy future for our nation. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, research work uh, in those four uh, pillars in our uh, research portfolio, uh, including the renewable uh, power, such as uh, uh, research on the solar, wind, uh, water, geothermal resources. Uh, we also have the work focusing on the su sustainable transportation, including bioenergy, uh, the vehicle technologies, uh, and also hydrogen. Uh, the third pillar in our research portfolio is the energy efficiency that includes the research uh, working with buildings, uh, advanced manufacturing, and uh, also government energy uh, management. And the fourth pillar in our research portfolio is really focusing on the energy system integration. And that's also where my work is mainly focused on. That's how you can uh, integrate those renewable energy resources into the power systems and how can you enable the hybrid systems um, uh, and also have the uh, secure and resilient power systems. 
So as a as a, at the Power System Engineering Center, which the center I'm working uh, uh, I'm working in. So our main um, goal is to conduct the high impact research and development to solve the challenges of seamlessly integrating conventional and renewable resources, uh, flexible loads, storage, and central and distributed generation, uh, enabling the resilient, reliable, flexible, secure, sustainable, and affordable power systems at all scales. So for the power systems, we actually mean the systems could be as small as the nanograde or microgrids all the way up to the distribution feeders systems and to the bulk power uh, bulk transmission systems. And at our center, we focus on uh, developing new and innovative uh, technologies to really enable the integration of those renewable and distributed resources into our, uh, our, power, uh, our power system operation and planning schemes. So that's a very brief introduction of, of NRA and uh, our Power System Engineering Center. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the predictive analytics and uh, especially why we are looking at the predictive analytics for power systems and also the uh, two applications uh, uh, where we use predictive analytics uh, to inform the power systems decision making. Uh, I don't think I need to emphasize a lot on the motivations why we really need the predictive analytics, uh, especially for the power systems with high penetrations of the DERs. So in the past couple of years, uh, and uh, we have seen the rapid growth of those distributed energy resources in the power systems. So for example, the, uh, the installation uh, and the capacity of the distributed PV systems in the US has been on the 20% annual growth in the past five years. And uh, by, the, uh, by the end of the 2020, it actually reached the 28 gigawatts total installed capacity in the US. And if we combine that distributed PV uh, with 50 million of smart appliances deployed at the US homes, uh, the increased sales in the electric vehicles uh, in the nation, and also the rapid uh, increase in the deployment of the energy storage uh, in the power systems. All of those uh, distributed energy resources could actually provide 200 gigawatts uh, flexibility potential in the US by the year of 2030. So that's only eight years away. And this 200 gigawatts flexibility potential actually accounts for 20% of the peak load. So this actually means those distributed energy resources have huge potentials to provide the much needed flexibility and the controllability to the power systems. And they can provide different types of great services uh, to, for the mutual benefits of, the, uh, of, those, resor of those resources and, of, and to the power systems. But you may wonder that a lot of those potentials could provided by the distributed energy resources are not fully used in the power, current power system operations. And the main reasons or the main challenge for not using the full uh, flexibility provided by those DERs are because of the lack of the observability in power systems, especially on the distribution systems where those DERs are connected. So traditionally, uh, power system operators uh, have done a very good job in monitoring the um, operation status in the transmission systems. A lot of the sensors have been deployed, uh, including the supervisory control and data acquisition system, uh, the phaser measurement units. And in the transmission system, there are actually redundant measurements. And by using those lots of measurements, uh, great operators can have a very good idea on what's, going, uh, what's happening in the power system. And based on their estimation, uh, they can actually perform a lot of the control and optimizations uh, to, um, to improve the reliability uh, of the power system. However, on the distribution system side, traditionally, there are not many measurements deployed uh, in the distribution system. Um, there may be just SCADA measurements deployed at the feeder head, uh, which collects the information only uh, at the substation level. But uh, uh, there may be some 
scatter uh, merriments deployed inside uh, uh, the feeders, but those merriments may not provide the full visibility and the full observability of the distribution feeders to the utilities or the grid operators. And the, uh, the recent deployment of those DERs actually provides or actually adds more sensors and adds more measurements in the distribution systems, such as the smart meters can provide the uh, measurements at the customers and the inverters equipped with the DERs can also provide uh, measurements uh, to reflect the status of those DERs. However, there are also challenges with those new deployed you know, sensors in the distribution system because there are actually, uh, so for one, they are not actually provide the full observability of the distribution system, even with those new sensors. And also those new type of sensors and measurements they are hydrogenous, uh, uh, hydrogenous in nature. So they actually have uh, different uh, time resolutions, uh, different qualities and different synchronization. And a lot of those data have not been fully utilized or fully integrated into the power system operations as right now. And to make the situation even more challenging, um, there, a lot of those DERs are actually deployed at the customer premises, so which we call behind the meter, behind the smart meter. Uh, so utilities usually do not have direct visibility of those behind meter DERs, but only have only monitor the whole house power consumption collected through the smart meters. So power system uh, doesn't usually know what's actually happening behind that smart meter. So they don't really know what are the uh, consumptions or the generations of the different DERs deployed at the household level. And the lack of visibility is really a challenge for fully utilizing the capabilities provided by those DERs. And uh, if we can have the behind meter DER visibilities, it can better, uh, uh, it can help the utility and the grid operators to better quantify the impact on the net load. Uh, uh, also help, uh, help them to analyze the impact of the DERs on the distribution system, not only on the net load uh, itself, but also uh, on the power flow, the voltage profiles, and uh, it can accommodate higher penetrations of the, uh, of the DERs integrated into the system. So because of those challenges are related to uh, power system are not having enough or full observability of those DERs deployed. So the predictive analytics are particularly crucial for providing the situational awareness for power systems. And this situational awareness is not only real-time situational awareness, so knowing what's happening right now, but also the forecasting of the predictive situational awareness, which uh, utilities, utilities and grid operators can know what's actually going to happen in the short-term future where they can better prepare the grid uh, to accommodate those ever-changing uh, grid conditions. So that's why we are looking at how can we develop the predictive analytics to improve the situational awareness for power systems. And in this presentation, I want to highlight uh, two applications of the predictive analytics for both the power system and also for the behind meter DERs. So the first application is uh, we are working on to develop a uh, predictive estimation, which is uh, a step forward uh, based on the traditional estimation. So we actually provide the estimation and the forecast of the power system states, which are the voltage phasors. And by using that uh, forecasted voltage phasors, uh, it can better inform the decision-making and the operation in the uh, distribution system. So that's one application. And the, se the second application uh, I'm going to talk about is how can we use data analytics to get the uh, visibility of those behind meter DERs? So if we only collect the measurement data as a smart meter, can we know what, what is the PV generation um, behind the meter on the rooftop? And for both of the applications, we are developing the data-driven methods with power system physics incorporated. So by combining both the physics with the data-driven method, 
we can actually do a better job of providing those uh, predict predictive situation situational awareness for power systems. So now let's look at the first uh, application. Uh, so it's on the predictive decimation. So traditionally, as I, uh, I mentioned, that state estimation has been widely adopted in the current operation in transmission systems. Uh, and it is actually the foundations for many applications uh, in the uh, transmission system operations. And uh, the conventional state estimation, the goal is uh, the inputs are the measurements collected in the transmission system. And by using a method called weighted list square, uh, it can estimate uh, the voltage phasors, both the magnitude, the angles uh, in the transmission system. But the traditional weighted least square method actually requires redundant measurements. So you need to have uh, the redundant measurements to get a good estimates on the system voltages. However, in the distribution system, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are not that many measurements and the system may not be fully observable. So the question is, can we still do state estimation accurately, but only using limited amount of measurements? So the answer is yes. And how, how do we really do this? So we actually borrow a concept from the Netflix recommendation system. So basically how Netflix recommends uh, the shows a user would like to watch on, based on uh, mining the uh, watching patterns of the users with the similar patterns and use the correlation in the watching patterns to actually make that prediction and recommendation. And the, uh, the method behind that recommendation system is a matrix completion uh, method. And in our uh, developed estimation algorithm for the distribution system, we use that same concept, but uh, apply it in the power systems by augmenting the matrix completion problem with the power system constraints. So that's where the physics information comes into play with the data-driven method. So a little bit deeper into how we really do this. So we actually formulate a uh, data matrix that contains both the unknown state variables, which are the uh, real part and the imaginary part of the voltage phasors uh, in the system, so those are the unknown variables we want to estimate. We also put the, uh, the measurements which are collected in the system, uh, including the active and reactive power measurements at individual nodes, and also the voltage magnitude measurements at individual nodes. So some of those measurements are collected in the system, so they are partially known, but a lot of them are still unknown variables in this uh, data matrix. So the problem we are facing is, we have this data matrix and the, the entrance, uh, the columns here are actually have correlations between them. Well, we, need, we want to estimate those unknown entries in this data matrix using this correlation. And the way we do it is we formulate an optimization problem uh, and we, we actually put the ob objective function to minimize the rank of the data matrix, uh, given the constraints of the known elements in this, this data matrix equals to the measurements. And also uh, the constraints includes the power flow equations. Um, but one point uh, I want to uh, mention here is since the full bloom AC power flow equations are nonlinear and uh, by including the AC power flow equations will actually make our problem very uh, difficult to solve. So instead we actually use a linearized version of the power flow equations uh, which, map, which models the power injections and voltage magnitude as a linear function of the voltage phasors. So by doing that, uh, our optimization problem is uh, much easier to solve. So you probably uh, will wonder that since a system is not fully observable, can you still solve this estimation problem and why this uh, uh, matrix completion method works? So first we want to uh, show that the low rank assumption actually holds because our uh, goal here is to minimize the rank of this data matrix we formulated. Uh, here I'm plotting the, uh, the 
the singular values of the data matrix we, uh, we formulated for a real utility feeder using the real data. And uh, we see that the first three largest singular values uh, are account for around 95% of the total singular values. And the last two uh, singular values are, are, are rather small. So this means uh, the formulated data matrix uh, is close to have a rank three. And that's actually verified that the formulated data matrix has indeed has a low rank. And on the theoretical side, uh, if you look at the traditional uh, matrix completion problem, where you just want to minimize the rank uh, of the data matrix subject to the known elements in that data matrix equal to the uh, measurements, uh, there actually exists a minimum number of entries required to uniquely recover this unknown uh, low rank matrix X. So there is a theoretical guarantee uh, that we can recover the unknown elements. And by incorporating the power flow constraints, so those physics-based physics information can actually help us uh, to require less of the measurements to be needed uh, to recover this uh, low rank matrix. And, and another as important aspect we uh, have looked at on um, using this uh, matrix completion based estimation algorithm is how can we make sure the, this algorithm can be scalable to uh, the real power systems, such as a system with uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. And the challenge here is since we formulate the estimation problem uh, as an optimization problem, and by minimizing the rank and doing some uh, like uh, approximations, so the problem we are solving is actually a semi-definite program, and semi-definite program is generally computationally intensive. So it may it may not uh, the the method itself may not scale very well uh, in the larger power systems. And the solution, the potential solution to improve the scalability of this method is to implement the distributed algorithm. So where uh, the idea is we just partition the, system, the whole system into subsystems, uh, like we show on the figure on the, right, uh, on the left hand side, we actually partition the uh, 123 node system, that's a standard IEEE test, test system into five different regions. And for each region, we formulate this uh, estimation problem uh, and solve it using their own information. But by exchanging some boundary conditions between the areas uh, and by, uh, by getting this communication, we can actually guarantee that the distributed algorithm will converge to the same solution as the centralized, uh, 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 centralized optimization problem. So what we are showing on the right-hand side is we, we plot the objective function values for all those five areas uh, we partitioned. And we say by exchanging the information among the, between the neighboring areas, uh, we are able to bring down this objective function values to convergence uh, after a couple of iterations. So by using the distributed algorithm, uh, we, we are able to uh, really improve the scalability of the uh, matrix completion based the estimation algorithm. And we actually test it using the real system data and uh, real system models. So that's how we do the uh, estimation part, which actually give us the uh, uh, estimates on what's happening uh, as right now in the power system. But for the predictive estimation, we want to go one step further by forecasting what's going to happen in the power system in terms of, in terms of the voltages. So in order to do the state forecasting, uh, we actually need to learn the spatial temporal correlation between the measurements and the system states. And this correlation will help us to forecast the system states uh, in the short term future by using the historical measurement data. Uh, you, you probably already guessed that this correlation could be very complex because we need to map the historical grid measurements into the future system states. And if we, if, we learn, if we want to learn this relationship directly, it could be a very difficult task. Uh, so in order to solve this uh, challenge, 
we, uh, we leveraged the idea of the kernel learning, which actually used the kernel functions to map the input space to a higher dimensional feature space. And in the feature space, we can learn a much simpler relationship between the feature space and the output space. And that could significantly reduce uh, uh, the, um, the complexity of learning this uh, relationship between the historical environments and the future system states. To further expand this, and uh, we incorporate the power, power system knowledge into uh, this kernel learning uh, based uh, forecasting approach. Uh, we actually de developed a different uh, type of kernels for the different types of uh, measurements, such as the power injections, uh, the power flows, the voltage magnitudes, uh, voltage angles, and the current uh, measurements we are having in the system, and uh, combine all those different kernels together through an optimization to provide the uh, forecasted voltages uh, in the short term future. So that's, that's what we did for de uh, developing the predictive estimation. Now I have some highlighted results I want to share with you on, uh, on the performance um, of those predictive estimation uh, algorithms. So first, let's look at the voltage estimation results. Uh, so we tested our uh, estimation algorithm using the real utility feeders from our partner. And the feeder has around 2,500 nodes. Uh, and we actually create the scenarios with 100% PV penetration, which means the peak PV generation equals to the peak close. Uh, so, at the, uh, so this is very high penetration for, uh, for the utility feeders. Uh, we consider three type of real sensors, which are currently deployed in the uh, in, in this utility feeder. So we have the SCADA, uh, SCADA measurements at the substations, which measures the active and reactive power and voltage magnitude at the substation. And we also assume that we know the angle reference. Uh, the second type of sensors we are having in the system is called grid 2020. Those sensors are deployed at the service transformers in the distribution system and it can get the active and reactive power measurements plus the voltage magnitude measurements. Uh, the third type of sensors we are having are the uh, uh, smart meter data through the advanced metering infrastructure, which provide the active power measurements and the voltage magnitude measurements. So for our seven realistic scenarios, uh, for the first scenario, we just assume we know the minimum uh, information in the system which we have the substation measurements and we know where the zero power injections are. So basically the nodes without any load and without any PV systems. And starting in uh, scenario two to seven, uh, we are adding 1% of the grid 2020 data into uh, as an input. And uh, starting from uh, scenario three, we are increasing the uh, AI percentage of the AMI data from 1% to 5% in the system. And the two figures on the right-hand side are showing the mean absolute percentage error in percentage for both the voltage magnitude estimates and the voltage angle estimates. So if, if we just use the bare minimum information with the substation measurements and the zero power injection uh, information, uh, the voltage magnitude estimation uh, error is, around, is a little bit higher than 2.5%. But if we can include 1% of the grid 2020 data and 1% of the AMI data, we are able to bring down that error to 0.5%. Uh, that's very accurate uh, in this estimation. Um, uh, and we are actually seeing the similar trend for the angle estimation. So by using um, the substation measurements plus 1% grid 2020 data, 1% AMI data, uh, we are able to achieve, uh, to bring the average angle estimation error to 0.5 degree. So this actually shows uh, we can achieve accurate estimation results with only the substation measurements plus 1% of uh, grade 2020 and 1% 1, 1, uh, 1, 1 of the AMI data. And next, uh, we, we are showing the results for the voltage forecasting. 
So here we are looking at the voltage forecasting uh, at uh, five minutes uh, at five minutes to fifteen minutes ahead of time uh, at one minute resolution. Uh, the input data we are taking are the active and reactive power uh, measurements uh, at the load nodes for the past one hour. Uh, we are having eighty percent of the data for the training. And after we train the model, we are getting, uh, we are using the rest, 20% uh, of the data for, uh, for testing and evaluation. So the two figures we are showing here uh, are the error distribution in both the training and the testing sets. So for both, of, for both the training and the testing, we say most of the errors, so the error distribution follows the normal distribution pretty well. And most of the errors are very concentrated around zero. And for the training data set, we do say 95% of the errors is smaller than 0.9%. And in the testing set, uh, the error is slightly larger. So we are saying the 95% of the errors is uh, around 1.1%. Uh, but this, this actually demonstrates uh, we can achieve uh, very accurate uh, voltage forecasting uh, results under this 100% PV penetration case. Especially with 100% PV penetration, the voltages in the system are fluctuating a lot uh, during, um, uh, uh, from time to time. So um, before I conclude this part of the application, uh, I want to mention that why the, it is really important to have the predictive state estimation versus the traditional state estimation. So with the predictive state estimation, uh, utilities and uh, uh, grid operators can proactively dispatch those controllable resources and can better coordinate the control efforts and prioritize the control needs. So we, we already integrated this predictive state estimation into uh, an optimal power flow problem to determine the best or the optimal set points for the distributed PVs in the system uh, to minimize the system losses and at the same time to optimize the voltage profiles. So the figure on the left-hand side are actually showing by using the information uh, from the predictive estimation and uh, to do the controls, we are able to uh, bring down the voltages of the system uh, closer to the desired value, which is one per unit, uh, compared to the case where there is no control. Uh, it's done in the, in the fader. And the figure on the left-hand side are actually showing, are showing a comparison between if you are doing the controls with and without the information from the predictive estimation. So with the information from the predictive estimation, uh, the utilities will know which part of the system will have more voltage violations and can prioritize the control needs for that area. So that's the reason why we say by using the predictive estimation, uh, we can further reduce the voltage violations by 30% in a 100% PV penetration scenario. Uh, so that's uh, the first application on developing the predictive estimations for uh, power system situational awareness. Uh, so just checking, uh, uh, are there any questions I should answer right now or should we just wait until uh, I finish the presentation? There is a question here. Are you able to hear? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. So on the predictive state estimation, it was around slide 12. I actually have two questions. So the first sure. one, it looked like the um, the power flow equation, you made the assumption mm -hmm. that uh, you linearized it because it was too computationally yes. intensive. Uh, is yes. it? Have you looked at parallelizing on the GPU? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So for the powerful equations, yes, we did linearize that. Uh, and we haven't looked at the parallel implementations using the GPU yet. Uh, we did do a parallel uh, implementation for the distributed algorithm we developed, um, but that's, that's on CPU. And we find the distributed algorithm is quite efficient. Uh, for example, we tested uh, the distributed algorithm on a feeder with uh, 2,500 nodes. And if we, uh, if we use the centralized problem, 
uh, it will take a minute, actually a little bit longer than a minute to, to solve that optimization. But if we can use the distributed algorithm with uh, parallel implementation, uh, we actually only need a couple of seconds uh, to solve that optimization problem. But we haven't tried uh, implement the, implementing the algorithm on, on GPU yet. Thank you. Any other questions I should answer now or should we just yeah, let's continue. continue? Okay, sure. Yeah, so that's the first application on the predictive decimation. Uh, another application I want to talk about is on uh, uh, the behind meter data analytics. So uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned briefly in the introduction part, so for the utilities, they only model, uh, they only monitor the uh, smart meter data and they don't really know what's happening behind the meter with all those DERs. So we have some initial work looking at, can we estimate the behind meter PV generation from the smart meter data? So basically saying we just look at the smart meter data and can we know how much uh, P, uh, behind meter PV generation is? And the first uh, uh, work I'm, I want to show uh, actually do the estimation of the behind meter PV uh, using uh, combining the physical plus statistical models. So the idea here is uh, we want to model the um, estimation of the solar generation using a physical uh, physical model. So we, we not only want to estimate the solar generation behind the meter, but we also want to estimate the solar PV parameters uh, and we leverage a physical PV system uh, performance model to map those PV uh, uh, parameters into the PV generation. And for the load part, uh, we use a statistical model to model the load. So that's a statistical hidden Markov model regression. And uh, we model the loads as a, uh, as a function of the variables, including the hour of the day, the temperature, uh, if the day is weekday week or weekend, and we develop an uh, iterative methods to do that. So the iterative uh, uh, method means that we take the net load uh, time series data, and we just first assume an initial uh, like set for the PV uh, parameters, and we use that set of PV parameters to, esti to, to estimate the PV generation, and, subs, uh, and add that PV generation back to the net load to get the load information and use the load information to estimate the parameters inside the hidden mark model. And uh, we, we, we just check how much deviations we have on the net load and we adjust uh, the power for the solar estimation to do another iteration of estimating the parameters of the solar system and uh, basically do this um, iteratively until it converges. Uh, we will also do a post dis disaggregation adjustment just to make sure that uh, the summation of the solar generation and the lo uh, load estimates will equal to the net load data exactly. So for this particular method, uh, we have tested using uh, 28 data uh, in the year of 2015, and uh, we, uh, we tested the algorithm using uh, 197 con uh, consumers, all with the PV installation. And here I'm just showing a, uh, um, a representative result for uh, five days. Um, and uh, we are showing the actual measurements for uh, the load consumption and the PV generation. <clears throat> and the, blue, uh, uh, the green curve represents uh, our proposed methods, uh, uh, the estimates from our proposed method, and the red curve uh, represents the estimates using a state-of-the-art method, uh, which used the consumer mixture model to estimate um, uh, the, the, uh, the load uh, um, uh, consumption. What we see here is if we look at the load consumption data, uh, we find that for this state-of-the-art method, uh, it actually overestimates the uh, uh, load consumption from time to time, uh, especially during the time when the actual consumption is very low, close to zero. Uh, but for our method, uh, we can do a very good job in estimating 
the near to zero uh, low consumptions uh, um, uh, in, uh, in the data. And for the solar uh, for the solar estimation, we do say that for the first four days, when the conditions are pretty sunny and the solar generation are pretty smooth, uh, so our methods and the state of the art methods can both do a very good job in estimating the PV generation. And also in the last day, when the solar generation is very intermittent, uh, our methods can do a very good job of estimating those intermittent uh, PV output as well. So on the, uh, we did a quantification on how much improvement we are seeing. So we, uh, for all the 28 days uh, average, we are actually seeing 44% reduction in the mean squared error compared to the state of the art method. So by using our proposed method, uh, we can accurately estimate the behind meter PV generation only, uh, only with the smart meter uh, data at the households. And we, we actually do one step further by not only uh, estimating the, uh, uh, the uh, generation of those behind meter PV system, but we want to quantify the uncertainties associated with those PV generation. Uh, so we develop another method uh, to provide the probabilistic estimation for those behind meter PV systems. And in this method, uh, we, we leverage the Bayesian uh, structure time series model. And this is purely data-driven method. So we haven't really used uh, uh, embed any physical information uh, into this data-driven method. And we have a very similar idea as what, uh, what we did before. So we just model the uh, solar generation and the load consumption uh, as a function of uh, uh, as, a, as a function of uh, the solar irradiance for the solar generation and for the low consumption, it's a, uh, it's a function of the, uh, some historical, uh, um, uh, it's a function of the, uh, those variables, including the temperature, uh, the time of the day, uh, day of the week, and if it's week, weekday or weekend, so that type of information. And by using this uh, purely data-driven method, uh, we can um, we can we can uh, we can develop this synthetic state space model, which represents the uh, disaggregated solar generation plus low consumption. And uh, our goal is we want to estimate the parameters uh, inside this state space model, and the fitting is performed by combining the common filtering and the Moncalo chain uh, Markov chain Moncalo uh, uh, method. So for the validation, uh, we are using, uh, uh, I think three months of data to do, uh, to do the validation. And here I'm showing the results uh, for one week. Uh, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's in January. Uh, here we show the behind meter PV uh, estimation at the substation level. So this is the aggregated PV uh, generation. And uh, we see here, uh, we not only can provide accurate uh, estimate of the PV generation as a substation, we can also quantify the uncertainties of those PV generation, both for the sunny conditions and the intermittent conditions. Uh, we, uh, for the estimation accuracy, we also compare our method with a baseline method uh, uh, in the literature. And we find that uh, in the January, uh, we test in both the uh, winter time, January and the summertime, August. And uh, our methods uh, can significantly improve the estimation uh, accuracy or reduce the estimation error for uh, the behind meter PV generation at the substations. So by using, those, by using this probabilistic method, uh, we can not only provide the accurate behind meter PV estimation at the substation, but also quantify the uncertainties around those PV generations. So uh, with that, this actually uh, concludes my presentation uh, today. So the key takeaways are uh, predictive analytics are really crucial to accommodate uh, the high penetrations of distributed energy resources. And it has um, many applications beyond those two I just showed on uh, providing the situational awareness for power system 
and it can also help to improve the controllability uh, in, the power, in, in the power system. Uh, and uh, another key point, uh, key takeaway is for the, uh, we can actually get better results if we incorporate the physics uh, into the data-driven methods. So by embedding the power system domain knowledge into machine learning or data-driven methods, uh, uh, those methods can actually do a better job. Uh, there are still quite several challenges associated, uh, associated with using or developing predictive analytics for power systems, especially with high penetrations of BERs. So the first challenge is the hydrogenous data we are having in the, in the power system. So the data may come from different type of sensors and may have different coverage in the system, may, may be collected at a different uh, time resolutions, uh, different synchronization and uh, uh, different entities may own, may own the data separately. So how can we best use the data to provide uh, the situational awareness and you leverage that data to uh, uh, for the power system operations and also planning is remains a challenge which uh, we are looking at. And another challenge uh, we, are, we are trying to solve is the scalability of the methods. So we, uh, we have done a lot of uh, development in novel methods, which can work very well in small systems, in toy examples, but how can we bring those methods into the real world? And are they scalable into larger systems? So that's a critical challenge we need to resolve. And uh, I think the last challenge I want to highlight is, uh, is really the adoption of the machine learning and data-driven methods in the real world. So in power system, there are machine learning algorithms have, have been widely used for forecasting, for example. Uh, but beyond that, a lot of those new, newer technologies involving data-driven methods and machine learning methods are still remain on papers and still remain within the research committee, uh, re research uh, com community. And how can we bring those newer technologies to be really uh, implemented, adopted in the real world for real system uh, is, a, is a challenge we, are, we, we try to solve, yeah. So uh, I think uh, the very last slide I have is, uh, if you want to learn more, so there is a link to the NREL grid related research. Uh, also, at least uh, some other relevant publications uh, I have, uh, which are looking at how can you use data uh, to do solar estimation and how can you use data to, do, uh, to design the, uh, more on the control side or to design the locational marginal price in the distribution systems. So that's just for, for your interest. Okay, yeah, I think that's the end of my presentation. So uh, I like, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you for a good, uh, wonderful presentation. There, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Before the before the questions, I actually have a, a quick question. Mm -hmm. if, if we can go back to slide 16, or Yes, this one, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the AMI, uh, does it mm -hmm. matter where the AMI data came from on the network? Uh, Chen I, I don't think I get your question. So you're, no, you, you're you, asking- you, yeah. you use 1%, right? 1% AMI you know, in your <laughs> table, 1%, 2%. Yes. Does it matter where the AMI data came from on the network, on the power grid? Um, so, uh, so in this, test, we actually, uh, so for this, uh, let me think, so for this realistic feeder, yes, we get the AMI data from the utility. So they are actually from the, uh, uh, the customers and, wow. uh, but in some other testing, uh, we actually do, we actually did some synthetic testing to say where you can place those uh, AMI meters and can, can that give you better results? Uh, and I think we, we, we didn't do much of the optimal sensor allocation, um, but right. we did perturb the placement of the sensors and we do see a variation in the performance. So if you can actually deploy, if you have the choice of deploy the sensors at the optimal locations, uh, you may get better results for the sensor. How, how much variations did you see? Did you observe? Um, so uh, actually the figures I'm showing on the uh, right-hand side actually shows, shows this variation. 
But this is just, uh, we, we kind of choose from all those uh, AMI locations. And uh, I think if, uh, if, we are, if we start adding, increase, increase the percentage of the AMI data, uh, the variation is actually smaller because you are actually having more AMI data in the system. Um, but I think if you have really small uh, AMI percentage, uh, this variation is not very large. It's, uh, I think it's around 0.1% uh, variations. And, and, and the estimation is independent of time of day? Um, that's a very good question. So uh, we did the test uh, uh, at different time of the day. And we find that the estimation works consistently well. So we say consistent like 0.5% estimation error for the magnitude, uh, despite any time of the day. Uh, but we do say that uh, from there, there are some times, especially not only not actually for the estimation, but for the forecasting, uh, if the PV generation is fluctuating very much then your forecast is actually, uh, you may have a little bit larger errors uh, in your forecast because it's kind of cha very challenging to forecast those large swings in the voltages due to the fluctuation of the PV. But for the estimation, we do say the results are pretty cons uh, consistent. Okay, good, cool. thank you. Yeah, the first question is, how do this uh, models inform decision between alternative methods of storage, such as battery versus hydrogen tanks or pump on hydro. Uh, so for that question, uh, in our work, we did consider some of the storage, especially battery storage, uh, because by using the, uh, the information provided by the predictive estimation, uh, we can coordinate the controls of the distributed PV and the storage. And we can actually uh, design um, the optimization using different objective functions for the different uh, devices like PV or storage. Um, but we haven't looked too much into you know, hydrogen or pump hydro uh, in, in, in our study. But we are trying to expand our collaboration with uh, internal NREL people and also outside NREL uh, to look at um, other, solu other solutions involve hydrogen or pump hydro. So for the second question, uh, uh, the question asks, does the performance of the estimation and voltage forecasting results depend on the magnitude of the voltage violations in the network? Yeah, I think that, that's, that's a very good question. So uh, I mentioned, I, I touched upon this a little bit uh, earlier. So for the, uh, for the estimation results, uh, uh, there, uh, the results are pretty consistent throughout the day, no matter when the voltage is actually over the uh, 1.05 per unit, when the PV generation is very high, or under the 0 0.95 per unit when the uh, when the uh, the peak load is happening. So the estimation results are fairly consistent. Uh, for the forecasting results, so um, the the uh, the absolute value of the voltage magnitude um, may not have that much impact, but because we are forecasting the voltages into the next 15 minutes, uh, if there are some large voltage swings uh, during that forecasting horizon, uh, it's actually more challenging to forecast very accurately, especially for the extreme points. Uh, so either for the upper uh, like extreme or the lower extreme. So we do say a slightly larger errors in those times, um, but we are trying to improve that uh, forecasting uh, accuracy during those extreme points. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, a follow-up question on that is if the voltage, uh, if the power flow linearization is more accurate closer to one per unit? Uh, so that's an excellent uh, question. Uh, so for the power flow linearization we are doing, so it's not just a linearization uh, around the operating points. So it's actually a linearization using two points and it's a method called fixed points. And uh, we did a test to say uh, how accurate this linearization of the power flow models is. And we find that uh, when the voltages are um, uh, kind of ranging from you know, 0 0.9 per unit to 1.1 per unit, 
uh, under the different loading conditions, uh, the method is actually, uh, the linearization is actually very uh, accurate, but it, it is true that the linearization is more accurate when the voltages are closer to one per unit. Yeah, I think the, the next question is uh, on the challenges for adoption in the real world and how to overcome those challenges. Yeah, so that's actually one of the biggest challenge we are facing uh, for people working on, you know, data driven and machine learning methods uh, for power systems. So, uh, yeah, I think for power systems, uh, uh, a lot of the machine learning algorithm have been adopted in doing forecasting, especially low forecasting, uh, also res uh, resource forecasting like uh, solar and wind forecasting. But beyond that, a lot of the uh, machine learning algorithm have not been really been adopted uh, by power system operators or utilities yet. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it's kind of challenging to say, how can we really promote the industry to adopt those new technologies? And uh, I think uh, on Unreal side, we have been working very closely with uh, industry partners like utilities, uh, vendors and uh, some AI companies. And we are trying to push uh, the adoptions uh, to, to kind of fill in the gap between the technologies and the real world implementation or real world applications. And to convince the industry partners that, you know, there are benefits of using those machine learning algorithms and uh, they can kind of to build the trust of using those. So hopefully we will see some, you know, pilots or some initial like adoptions of some of the newer technologies in the real world. Uh, but I will say this is a challenge that the whole research and the industry, uh, industry communities need to work together to uh, address those. Yeah, so the uh, next question is how do we, uh, how do we linearize the power flow equations? Uh, so I have a link um, uh, or a reference uh, in my presentation slide. So you can, you can take a look at the, linear, uh, the paper on the linearized power flow equations, um, but we do consider the losses and also the reactive power uh, in, the, uh, in our linearization model. So we, we, we consider that. So that's the reason why the linearized uh, power flow model uh, it's kind of it, it's very uh, it's accurate and it actually fits uh, uh, our purpose of doing the state estimation well. Yeah. The uh, the next question is: uh, Is there any open source data sets for this sort of studies? And if so, uh, share some links. So yes, we do have some open source uh, data sets for uh, the studies we can uh, we uh, we performed uh, and. Uh, yeah, I can uh, I can share some links uh, uh, in my slide deck, uh, and you can just uh, click on the link to uh, to look at those open source data sets. And uh, an another uh, heads up I want to share with you guys is uh, so currently we are working on a new project which just started to build an open library to host those advanced uh, DER management algorithms like estimation and OPF algorithms and related data sets under a, uh, a DOE funded project. So we, we are going to build this open library to host the data analytics method and the data sets. And that library is going to be completely open to public. Uh, so stay tuned on that. And uh, you probably say some uh, like uh, email from me saying, yeah, you can go to this website to, to check out our data sets. Any other questions from our students? Okay. I have one. Yeah. So uh, looking at the performance of the models, it's a little hard for me to wrap my mind around what mm -hmm. a level of good performance is. Because yeah. in, in different domains, the, uh, what is a 5% yes. MAPE error? Like, do we, do we care that we have that much error or mm -hmm. not? And so could you go back to, I think slide 16 had some, mm -hmm. Um, displays of performance. I was just sort of wondering like, yeah. what is sort of the, the industry standard, the state of the art can be at one mm -hmm. level and you can improve on it, but yeah. what are some sort of guideposts or milestones of sort of mm -hmm. what is useful performance yeah. in these yeah. applications you're talking about? 
and it could be very hard to define. <laughs> yeah, um, that's an excellent point. So when we did this study, we have been asking ourselves how good is really good, right? Especially in terms of voltage estimation, because voltages can, um, uh, your voltage only has a very small range to vary. So the voltage doesn't vary from zero to two per unit per se. So it only varies around, uh, you know, uh, like five to 10% around one per unit. So that, that's one indication that, you know, if you ended up with 3% of the error, it could be if your voltage is one per unit, you are actually estimating your voltage to be 1.003 per unit. So that's going to be having some problem in the voltage estimation. So uh, I think we, we did some study and I think uh, I also got some feedback from our industry partners. Uh, I, uh, I think though, uh, if we can keep the voltage estimates error below 1% uh, under very high PV penetration scenarios, because uh, under very high PV penetration uh, scenarios, you may have over voltage uh, violations uh, more frequently. So I think, yeah, our target was to achieve 1% of uh, estimation error. Uh, and uh, yeah, we actually have, you know, achieved 0.5%. And um, yeah, that actually means, you know, if your, um, uh, if your voltage is uh, one, per, uh, one per unit, your estimation error, your estimated voltage could be just like uh, 1.005 per unit. So that's fairly accurate for the estimation. And uh, another point you brought up is how the uh, error of the estimation will impact the control. So that's something we actually looked at in our study. So we have taken the estimated uh, uh, voltages and the forecasted voltages uh, into our optimization to determine the optimal set points for DERs. And we find that within the errors we have right now, uh, we, uh, our control performance uh, is very good. So we don't actually have uh, very, how should I say, the pro propagation of the uh, estimation error into the larger uh, errors on the control side. So by knowing what's going to happen uh, in the next 15 minutes for the voltages, uh, we are able to proactively dispatch and coordinate the uh, resources such as voltage regulators and the DERs uh, to perform, to optimize the voltage profile very well. And we compare that with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the information of the perfect knowledge and we don't see much deviation there. Yeah, but I think, yeah, your, your point is, is spot on. So that's the important question that how good, you, you should always ask like how good is really good and how the arrows will propagate through, you know, um, the, the Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, there's actually one more question in the Q&A, but maybe just, uh, uh, I'll email this question to you. Okay. And, uh, uh, reply to this particular person I have for it. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all.